it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The Parchment by Deep Strike Operations Company, part of the 1st Special Operations Regiment under command of the Joint Special Operations Command out of Fort Bragg, consisted of 90 operatives, including three maneuvers platoons of 22 soldiers each, one heavy weapons platoon of 22 soldiers, and a command element consisting of our unit commander and unit first sergeant. Unlike most combat maneuver units, which were tasked with destroying foreign adversaries outside of the country, the four regiments under the Deep Stripe Operations Command of the JSOC, or Joint Special Operations Command, were tasked with finding, fixing and destroying domestic threats to the nation, and to our particular DSO company, was given the most important mission in the history of the nation. Captain Jenkins, our unit commander, had briefed us on the mission which we'd been assigned to we spent weeks practicing exactly how we'd execute the operation. Lieutenant Mayton's 1st Platoon would attack the Rebels' main defensive lines from the north, with the support of the mortars and heavy machine guns from Lieutenant Lynch's heavy weapons platoon. Once the Rebels were engaged with 1st Platoon, Captain Jenkins and Lieutenant Wilson's 2nd Platoon would breach the Rebel lines where they were weakest in the east. Once the Rebel lines were breached, I would lead my 3rd Platoon through the breach and to the Rebel compound killing every rebel we saw, and securing the objective. The rebel base was roughly two miles square, consisting of a concrete compound located somewhere on the rolling pastures of Killeen, Texas, just outside of the great army base of Fort Hood. It was surrounded by triple strands of razor wire and concrete barriers. Behind this were walls of HESCO barriers and emplaced fighting positions. Four concrete bunkers surrounded a group of multi-story buildings which were used as barracks to house the estimated 300 to 400 rebel fighters at the base, along with an unknown number of rebel civilian terrorists. All total, we assumed that around 1,000 rebel terrorists were occupying the base, over half being civilians. Our S2 intel guys speculated that the cowardly rebels were using their civilians as human shields in case of an assault just like this. Near the center of the compound was a two-story concrete building with machine guns in place at each corner. It was in this one building where our S2 guys said that the rebels' sacred parchment was located. Once we secured it and got out, the very reason for the rebels' existence would vanish. Without the parchment's almost hypnotic and demonic control over the rebels' minds, this war would be over. My platoon, along with Lieutenant Wilson's second platoon, was charged with securing that building and finding that damned parchment. Nothing else mattered, and all the rebels that we encountered were to be eliminated. The very importance of this mission meant that we would not have time to secure prisoners, even if we were inclined to do so. If we were swift enough and violent enough, we could be in the building, secure the rebel document, and get out before the rest of the rebels knew what had hit them. If we could kill the rebel Stinger anti-aircraft missile teams, we'd call in our supporting Apache helicopters from nearby Fort Hood to completely obliterate the entire terrorist base. The leader of this particular rebel faction was a former army major general named Lincoln, a traitor to the party and the nation. Most of his armed fighters were also traitors, former soldiers who'd served with various army units from the 1st Infantry in Kansas, the 1st Cavalry in Texas, the 101st from Kentucky, the 82nd Airborne from North Carolina, and the 29th Light Infantry from Virginia, among others. In fact, it was traitorous soldiers of the 29th Light Infantry Division which had stolen the parchment from our possession, killing many innocent people as the traitors brought the parchment from Virginia to Texas. We could also safely assume that this rebel faction was also bolstered by traitors from other branches of the service, such as the U.S. Marines, the Air Force, and the Navy. They were traitors, all of them. And just like we did to the commanding general of the 29th Light Infantry Division, we relentlessly hunted down and executed every military traitor we found. We were the patriots who were fighting to save the nation and our values from their evil and hatred. The rest of General Lincoln's fighters were made up of fanatical civilian militiamen who had also fallen under the sway of that vile and corrupt parchment. 
General Lincoln commanded several groups of these civilian militiamen, who were in turn led and trained by cadres of former military members turned treasonous insurgents. These militiamen were nothing more than domestic terrorists, attacking our supply convoys and bombing government and vital infrastructure such as roadways and bridges. Their anti-government terrorist activities kept many of our local units occupied with chasing down their various militia groups as they blended in with the local civilian population after their cowardly attacks against the government. But after over a decade of civil war, in which countless good, right-thinking citizens had been murdered by these brainwashed rebels, it would all end today. The war would end today. Our unit was committed and determined that no sacrifice would be too great to defeating the rebels and finally ending the suffering of the nation. We would finally be free of the yoke which threatened our way of life and finally be masters of our own destiny. Today, at all costs, the nation would finally be united under one government, one belief, one people, one way of thinking and one flag. Over the past few months, the rebels have been steadily losing ground all across the country, and many of the rebel units have gathered here around Fort Hood to make one final stand, fanatically protecting the last vestiges of their vile and evil historical artifacts. Of all the despicable relics of the treasonous rebels' history, the most wicked and evil of their artifacts was a secret parchment which spoke evil thoughts and wicked desires into the hearts of the rebels. Once we'd captured that accursed parchment, we hoped that the rebel spirit would break and the war would finally come to an end. It was 1700 hours in late spring when our platoons were in position to finally hit the rebel base in Killeen. We suddenly opened up on their defensive positions with 81mm mortars and heavy automatic weapon fire. We hadn't used helicopter gunships in the opening assault as the sound of the aircraft would have alerted the rebels of the coming assault and we didn't want them leaving and taking the parchment with them. Besides, our S2 guys gave an intelligence briefing, stating that the rebels may have Stinger surface-to-air missiles, which they'd stolen from the National Guard armory near Fort Hood, and it would have given the rebels a much-needed morale boost to have shot down one of our Apache attack helicopters. In addition, our intel guys informed us that the rebels had M250 caliber machine guns, MK-19 automatic grenade launchers, and even a few armoured Humvees and track vehicles, all looted from the Texas National Guard. We were in position, hidden below low, rolling scrub and sand dunes roughly 200 metres from the western perimeter of the rebel base, when Lieutenant Maiton's 1st Platoon began their diversionary assault on the rebel northern perimeter. Immediately, our mortars fell on the known rebel fighting positions, collapsing bunkers and trenches and their checkpoints. From my position, I could see a rebel checkpoint take a direct hit from a mortar round, the two enemy guards stationed there blown to bits and their Humvees completely destroyed. Lieutenant Maiden and his men were making good progress, easily blowing holes in the rebels' perimeter wire and breaching the base perimeter. The rebels were caught completely off guard, as there was very little return fire compared to the devastating fire we were pouring into them from 1st Platoon and Lieutenant Lynch's heavy weapons platoon. To our satisfaction, we could see groups of rebel soldiers yelling and running towards the breach in their defences as the heavy thump thum 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 of our M250 cal machine guns slammed into the charging rebels. That's it, yelled Captain Jenkins. Go, 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 go! He and Lieutenant Wilson's second platoon raced towards the rebel base's western perimeter, which was guarded by two strands of razor wire and a chain-link fence topped with some more barbed wire. Strangely, they received only sporadic return fire from the rebel defenders as Wilson's men made it to the perimeter fence without sustaining any casualties and quickly blew a wide, gaping hole in it. I led my third platoon closely behind Wilson's platoon as we infiltrated through the gap which they'd made. Return fire from the enemy was gaining steadily while Wilson's platoon provided suppressive fire against the rebel fighting position. My platoon breached the perimeter fence and entered the rebel compound. Breathing heavily as I ran towards the objective, I heard a warning yell off to my right, followed by the grunt of one of my men. I turned to see one of my soldiers crumple to the ground, 
a bearded rebel traitor wearing a U.S. Marine Corps uniform standing a few meters away. He fired again and dropped another one of my soldiers. I spun around, raised my M4 rifle, and dropped the former U.S. Marine with three shots. Before I could react, the door to the one-story building next to me flew open, and a little girl, around five years old, with tightly braided golden hair and wearing a light blue sundress, ran towards the traitorous Marine whom I had just killed. She was screaming, Daddy! 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 I allowed the child to make it to her father's dead body before I yelled, The little girl has a gun. Immediately, soldiers around me echoed, She has a gun! as I put three rounds into her back. Her body stood up from the impact of my rounds, and she fell forwards over her father's body. As part of our rules of engagement, the government would not allow us to shoot unarmed civilian traitors unless we identified that they had a gun. This allowed us to cleanse those traitorous enclaves such as this one quickly and efficiently. A scream echoed behind me as a young woman stood terrified at the doorway, several other small children behind her. She was screaming, Katie, Katie, oh my God, Katie. Apparently Katie was the name of the traitorous little terrorist girl. A school, I thought, an indoctrination center where these rebels brainwash the next generation of rebel terrorists into their wicked, hate-filled ideology. Sergeant Ergood, I yelled to my platoon sergeant. Carl Gustav, I said, pointing at the indoctrination center. I'm on it, said Ergood on slinging the Carl Gustav recoilless rifle from his broad shoulders and quickly firing an 84mm rocket into the doorway of the building which the rebels were using to brainwash children in the ways of the wickedness and evil. Sergeant Allgood yelled, She has a gun! The soldiers around him echoed, She has a gun! The young teacher was still standing there at the doorway and she took the brunt of the rocket which blew her to pieces. The rocket detonated inside the building, blowing out the walls and caving in the roof on the next generation of potential terrorists. As I ran past the building towards the target objective building, I tossed an incendiary grenade into the school for good measure, again yelling, The survivors have guns! Well, it's better to kill terrorists while they're still little children rather than have to fight them when they get older. A round pinged off the concrete next to me as another of my men went down, wounded. I looked towards the target building a hundred meters away from me, a rebel terrorist firing from one of the first floor windows. I took cover beside one of the bunkers and fired into the window as Sergeant Airgood came up behind me. Medic, take care of Private Stern, said Airgood. Specialist driver, get that 240 Bravo going. Sit up behind that truck over there and cover the building. The specialist driver was ten meters to my left across the concrete quad next to another bunker took cover behind a parked rebel two-and-a-half-ton truck before firing at the suspected rebel positions in the target building. The medic had dragged Private Stern to cover behind us, along with the help of three other soldiers from my platoon. Ergood, I said, pointing to the heavy double doors of the target building. Get down, yelled Ergood, as he fired the Carl Gustav at the doors. The entrance to the building blew apart as glass and debris blew out of the surrounding first-floor windows. Follow me, I yelled, and without looking back, charged towards the building, tossing smoke grenades in front of me to cover our hundred-meter sprint towards the objective building. Grabbing a high-explosive grenade from my vest, I tossed it into the broken window where I'd seen the rebel terrorists firing at us. A half-second later, it exploded. I and my platoon then rushed into the concrete building. We were met with rubble and debris and rising clouds of dust and smoke as we entered. The bodies of three dead rebel terrorists lay broken in the hallway. Two terrorist female civilian militiamen and a traitor wearing a U.S. Army uniform. All were armed with assault rifles. I entered the first room to the right, where we had taken fire. A dead rebel terrorist fighter wearing an Army uniform lay blown apart. A destroyed M4 rifle laying next to his body. Look out! yelled Ergood as he tackled me from behind, just as a round passed inches from my head. I heard shots from behind me as I rolled over. 
Specialist Driver's 240 Bravo machine gun was smoking as he stood over the dead body of a female rebel terrorist wearing a US Navy uniform and a nine pistol still clutched in her dead hands. Thanks, Sergeant, I said as Airgood pulled me up. He glanced over at the dead Latina female wearing the US Navy uniform. Oh, that little bitch must have only been wounded when you fragged the room, sir. Specialist driver spat at the dead sailor. Secure this floor quickly, I commanded. That parchment must be here somewhere. Radio. I turned to Specialist Felaka, my radio man. He handed the field phone to me. Six, this is five, I said, calling Captain Jenkins over the secured network channel. Five, this is six. Go replied Captain Jenkins, identifying me as five. Six, I said. We are in the objective building and in the process of securing the first floor. I have two KIA and one WIA. Six hostiles are KIA. We are conducting the search for the target. Over. Roger five, said Captain Jenkins. We're about 200 meters from the objective building. The rebels hit us from the north and south as we were closing in behind your platoon. We lost First Sergeant Sunshine in their ambush. The rebels recovered quickly after we breached their perimeter. Six, I said, suddenly concerned. Do you need us to pull out and support you? Negative five, said Captain Jenkins. Negative. Secure the building and find that goddamn parchment. We'll take care of the rebels here and secure the perimeter around the building. Roger six, I said. Five out. Let me know once you've secured the target item, five, said Jenkins. Six out. I heard gunfire coming from the rear of the building, towards where Lieutenant Maiden's first platoon was conducting their diversionary attack. Our mortars were impacting closer, as first platoon moved deeper inside the rebel base. Running into the debris-strewn hallway, we passed a relatively secure room to the left. Medic, I yelled as I ran past. Take Private Stern in there and set up a makeshift aid station. The hallway ended at a T-junction, which ran right and left. On the right was a hallway which passed two other rooms and ended at a flight of stairs. Four of my men were already clearing this side. To the left was a similar hallway which ended at a set of heavy exit doors next to another set of stairs leading upstairs. The exit doors were opened and three of my men were firing out the open doorway. Behind them... The bodies of two enemy soldiers lay, along with the wounded body of one of my men. I ran to my fallen soldier. Talk to me, Sergeant Schumer, I said. I'll lift, sir, said Schumer, clutching his chest where the enemy round had hit his body armor. We got them when they were trying to run out the back. Oh, they aren't staying to put up a fight. The terrorists took off out that door. Medic, I yelled back down the hallway. I patted Sergeant Schumer on the shoulder. Uh, the medic is coming to take you to the aid station. I'll come and check on you when I can. Just get that damn parchment, sir, said Sergeant Schumer, wincing. The body armor prevented the round from puncturing his chest, but it was most certain that Sergeant Schumer had a few broken ribs at the least. I nodded and ran down the hallway to where my men were firing out of the door. In the side room next to the doorway by the stairs, Four more of my men were shooting out of broken windows at the retreating terrorists. I ran into the room and caught a glimpse out of the window. The body of one enemy soldier, wearing a US Army uniform, lay dead a few meters from the exit. And another enemy, this one a female wearing a US Air Force uniform, also lay unmoving. In a concrete drainage ditch about a hundred meters distant, a mixed force of rebel terrorists wearing Army and Marine uniforms along with a handful of civilian militiamen, were firing back towards a building we'd just occupied. They were providing cover fire for a pair of rebel terrorists who were trying to carry a third injured one over open ground to the safety of the drainage ditch. Specialist driver, who had crouched down behind the concrete wall to reload his 240 Bravo machine gun, stood up and fired out the window. Inexorably, his 7.62mm rounds walked towards the retreating rebel terrorists, stitching the backs of the two female U.S. Army traders, who were probably medics, and the traitorous male U.S. Marine who they were carrying. The three traders fell forward to the ground as we increased our fire at the rebel terrorists in the drainage ditch. 
as I joined in on the shooting. I happened to peer over at the bodies of the three rebel terrorists which Driver had just shot in the back. The marine traitor was still alive. He painfully rolled over, clutching a bloody M16A4 rifle in his hands, and fired a single shot back towards us. Driver's head snapped back with a loud crack and he slumped to the floor. Enraged at the traitor marine's cowardice, I emptied the remainder of my magazine into the terrorist marine, ending his threat to the nation once and for all. Outside of the room, I heard a loud crack as one of my soldiers shooting out of the exit door fell backwards, half of his head missing. They're in defilade, I yelled. We need to get to the second story to fire down on them. We'll keep their heads down, sir, yelled Sergeant Ergert, grabbing driver's blood-soaked machine gun. Right, I answered, grabbing the Carl Gustav from Ergert. Give me a few minutes to get upstairs. Filarka. I yelled to my radio man, come with me. I ran out of the room, grabbing my two remaining soldiers who were shooting out of the exit door, ordering them to follow me. Stepping over the body of my dead soldier, the four of us raced up the stairs. There were windows at regular intervals which lined the stairs, and the rebels, catching on to my plan, began shooting at the windows as we dashed up to the second floor. As the windows shattered behind me, I heard one of my soldiers grunt, then tumble down the stairs. I didn't turn around. Instead, I kept running along with my remaining two soldiers up to the second landing. We leapt through the open double doors and dove behind the sturdy concrete wall under the windows lining the hallway. Four soldiers came up from the stairwell at the other end of the hallway, about twenty meters away. Relieved, I saw that they were my men who cleared the right side of the building downstairs. I motioned them to get down, then, using hand gestures, signal my riflemen to return fire down at the rebel terrorists in three, two, one. All seven of us got up as one and began firing down at the traitors' positions. I saw three of them fall backwards into their ditch from our fire, but most of them were still under such good enough cover that, even at our elevated positions, we still couldn't gain fire superiority over them. Suddenly, from the rebel terrorist's right flank came the doo -doo 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 of an M240 machine gun. It stitched the right side of our hallway, and the upper torso of one of my soldiers at the other end of the hallway exploded. We all took cover again under the windows. <sighs> they brought up a 240, I yelled as the terrorists raked the entire length of the second floor windows back and forth. We were showered by shards of glass and debris of concrete and aluminum. I cover my face from the shower of glass as the machine gun, rounds, zipping only three feet above me, hit a wooden door behind me and blew it inwards. I looked back to see it was some sort of maintenance room with a metal ladder leading up to a trap door to the roof. Cover me, I yelled as I grabbed up the Carl Gustav recoilless rifle and low crawled into the maintenance room. I didn't have to look back to know that my men were already up on their feet and firing down at the traitors as I heard the return of our M4s returning fire. I made it into the maintenance room and rolled over, seeing a padlock securing the trap door. Immediately I fired at the lock with my rifle, ignoring it as it fell behind me as I got up, abandoned my rifle and scrambled up the ladder, catching the Carl Gustav. Once on the roof, I carefully peered over the side. From this vantage point, I could see down directly into the terrorist's ditch. There were seven of them, two traitor U.S. Marines, three civilian terrorist militia fighters, and two traitor army soldiers manning the M240 machine gun. They were trapped and couldn't leave the ditch without us shooting them. In contrast, we could not secure this building with them still outside. The two traitor Marines and the three militiamen were preparing to assault back into the building, under covering fire of their M240 machine gun. They hadn't noticed me. I carefully rolled the muzzle of the recoilless rifle over the edge of the roof, aimed the launcher at the enemy machine gunners, and fired. The two traitor U.S. Army soldiers disappeared in a black cloud of high explosive and dirt. The impact knocked over the three terrorist militiamen just as the two traitor marines started their charge towards the open door. I pulled an M68 frag grenade and threw it directly into the ditch where it exploded amongst the militiamen trying to recover. One of the fanatical terrorist militiamen tried vainly to jump on the grenade, 
her long brown hair whipping about her head and right shoulder like a bloody pinwheel as she was blown apart. The two traitorous marines died defiantly only a few feet from the door in a hail of my men's rifle fire, but before dying the bastards managed to wound three of my men. I had no time to celebrate our victory. We had secured the terrorist rebel's prized building when a bright flash of light erupted from the direction of where Lieutenant Maiden and his first platoon were conducting their diversionary attack. White, hot gas and smoke blossomed 300 meters to my left. I instinctively ducked at the sound of the blast, then seeing a huge plume of smoke rising behind the air conditioning units, I ran across the roof towards the north side of the building. As I reached the edge, I was hit by a wave of intense heat, as if I'd opened the door of a huge oven in hell. It burned my eyes and eyebrows and smelled of oil and fume. The acrid smoke choked me and my eyes began to water. Looking down over the edge of the roof, my view was partially obstructed by one-story concrete buildings and bunkers, but I could see that a very large explosion, perhaps some sort of incendiary explosion, had detonated where Lieutenant Maiden's first platoon had occupied the terrorist rebel fighting trenches. Three hundred meters away, the trench line for a full 100 meters was awash in billowing clouds of flames and white smoke. From my vantage point, I could hear the screams of Lieutenant Maiden's burning and dying soldiers. Then, to the northeast, about two kilometers away, towards low foothills lined with trees, I could hear the faint boom, boom, boom of high explosive rounds impacting, followed by smoke blooming above the tree line. That was where Lieutenant Lynch's heavy weapons platoon was positioned, providing fire support with the mortars. Almost immediately after I saw the explosions at his position, the mortar support for our assault stopped firing. I turned and yelled, Radio! and cursed when I saw that my radio man, Philarka, who was supposed to follow me closer than my shadow, wasn't there. I ran back across the roof towards where the trap door was leading back down into the building. As I approached the open trap door, I saw my platoon sergeant, Sergeant Ergood, emerge followed by one other soldier. Ergood handed me my M4 rifle. Thanks, Ergood, I said as I looked at the other soldier, Private First Class Omar, who was now carrying Falaka's bloody radio. What happened to Falaka? Took a round to the side when you were all running up the stairs, sir, answered Sergeant Ergood. Doc has him in his aid station. How do we look, Ergood? I said. The hot breeze from the searing wind did nothing to cool my sweat-soaked brow on the rooftop as I looked over my shoulder again, the white smoke still billowing in the distance. Thankfully, I could no longer hear the sounds of men screaming and burning. Part 2 5 K.A. 5 WIA. Including you, we have 12 operational. The building is secure, sir. Sir, Captain Jenkins has been trying to raise you on the horn. Damn it, I yelled, grabbing the radio from Private Omar. I should have kept the radio close to me. Six, this is five, I yelled into the radio, expecting Captain Jenkins to chew my ass out for not responding to his call sooner. Five, yelled Captain Jenkins. Thank the government you're alive. Have you secured the building? I could hear yelling and heavy small arms fire from his position over the radio. Yes, sir, I answered. We took some casualties, but the objective is secure. Have you found that accursed parchment five? Captain Jenkins, with a hopeful tone in his voice, said. In the background, I could hear the voice of Lieutenant Wilson shout. Sir, they're flanking us. We need to pull back to the bunker line. Negative, sir, I answered. We've just cleared the last of the terrorists from the building and are in the process of searching it now. Five, yelled Captain Jenkins. You need to find that parchment. The fate of the nation depends on you. Look, continued Captain Jenkins. General Lincoln set a trap. Somehow they knew we were coming. I let the first platoon assault deep into their defensive lines, putting up just token resistance then detonated barrels of food gas which they dug into their second-line defensive trenches. Ah, oh, they've completely taken out our first platoon. Shit, I cursed silently, 
and weapons platoon. They're being hit by M1 tanks out of Fort Hood, answered Captain Jenkins. What? I said. But the Three Corps commander at Fort Hood swore allegiance to the rifle government of the United States. The Three Corps commander lied, answered Captain Jenkins. The Army 1st Cavalry Division and the Army 3rd Cavalry Regiment have joined the traitorous rebellion. The soldiers loyal to the government are being rounded up and detained. I cursed loudly. The U.S. Army garrison at Fort Hood, the largest U.S. Army post in America, had joined the rebellion against the duly appointed government of the United States. What kind of wickedness and evil was written on that damn parchment that would cause our brothers and sisters in arms to turn to treason and sedition? Well, it didn't matter. There'd be a terrible reckoning coming. All those traitors would die. Their families, their children. All of those traitors would die. I could hear the violent firefight from Captain Jenkins' position being echoed in my radio, raising in volume and intensity. I strained to see what was going on, but my view was blocked by smoke and burning structures and vehicles. To the north, I could catch glimpses of rebel terrorists both former military and civilian militia, closing in on Captain Jenkins and what was left of the second platoon. Five, came Captain Jenkins over the radio. We're pulling back. We're going to try and bring as many of the terrorists after us as we can. You have to find that damn parchment. Roger, six, I answered before handing the receiver back to Private Omar. Sergeant Airgood, I yelled, turning to my platoon sergeant. We lost 1st Platoon and Weapons Platoon. They knew we were coming. The commander's pulling back with the rest of the 2nd Platoon to try and draw the terrorists away from us. Sergeant Allgood nodded in concern. I left out the part about Fort Hood joining the rebels, although Sergeant Allgood probably already figured it out. Take 1st, 2nd and 3rd squadrons to secure the 1st floor and search for that parchment. I'll take Specialist Teffer, Private Omar and Private Anne from 4th Squadron Search the second floor. Okay, Omar? Omar, I yelled to the little soldier. Stay glued to me with that radio. We all ran back down the ladder to the second floor as random small arms fire ricocheted across the roof behind us. Sergeant Allgood boomed at the third squad leader to take his team and follow him down to the first floor where first and second squad had already taken up defensive positions. Let me know ASAP if you find that fucking parchment. I yelled. Roger that, sir, answered Allgood as he led the three soldiers down the stairs. Meanwhile, I grabbed Specialist Teffer and Private Anne, the two soldiers from 4th Squad who'd followed me up the stairs earlier and commanded, Follow me. We're going to do a thorough room-by-room -room search of every inch of this floor until we find that goddamn parchment. And finding the parchment was ridiculously easy. It was in a conference room, which was just two doors down to the right. Private Omar saw it first. I was looking into a room slightly offset to the left of the hallway, when Private Omar ran ahead a few steps and looked into the conference room on the right. Sir, he said, there is something in this room that you must look at. Oh, Private Omar's Filipino accent always got to me. I angrily ran towards him and threw him hard against the wall. I told you to fucking stay next to me with that damn radio. If you even think about going beyond my arm's reach, I will blow the brains out of the back of your goddamn head. Do you understand? Private Omar looked up at me, nodding furiously. I spun around and entered the conference room, and there it sat. It was dark tan in color, about 18 inches wide, brittle and ancient looking, and rolled into a tight scroll and tied by a red ribbon. It sat on a sturdy oaken table, surrounded by other evil and wicked historical artifacts which were the heart and soul of the irredeemable and deplorable terrorist rebellion. There it was, the inspiration of hundreds of years of horror and hatred and pain and slavery, the sole cause of all the suffering which has been inflicted on the United States ever since it was written. And hanging on the wall overlooking the parchment was the vile flag of the rebellion. It was the rallying symbol of hatred and horror for these vile, anti-government traitors. The rebels' hideous flag hung between two wide windows facing south. Looking out the window, 
Three hundred meters away, I could see at least a company of rebel terrorists rapidly advancing across the base towards our captured building. They were all wearing the U.S. Army 1st Cavalry patch. I spat at the cowardly traitors. They'd enslaved themselves to this parchment, this damned parchment. Tifa and Anne burst in behind me. Sir, we didn't find the parchment down the other end of the... Specialist Tifa fell silent, his mouth agape. Is that... started Private Anne. Get out, I yelled. Get out and secure the next room. We got hostiles approaching from the south. Move. Our orders were very clear. Once found, absolutely no conscripted soldier was to touch the parchment, much less go near it. Only the senior officer in charge was authorized to secure the parchment and get it out of rebel hands. Omar, I yelled. Get that radio off and give it to me. He shrugged out of the backpack which contained the radio and handed it to me. I grabbed it out of his hands and yelled, Now, get your little ass over into the next room with Tifa and Anne in it. Private Omar's eyes went wide and he jumped forward, his arms outstretched towards me. Sir, he screamed. Clenched my fist, ready to punch this traitorous little asshole in the face. Oh, I knew it was a mistake to let their kind be conscripted into the military. But the little guy was on me quickly, and he pushed me to the ground just as the window behind me exploded. I opened my eyes, ears ringing. I was lying on my back, staring up at the ceiling. The weight of Private Omar's body was on me, but he wasn't moving. I painfully rolled him over, broken glass rolling off his back. He'd saved my life, although a bullet had blown half his face away. I knew it was a good idea to let these loyal little bastards be conscripted into the military after all. My secondary Motorola, which we used only for inter-platoon communications, came to life and, despite my ears still ringing from the sounds of small arms fire coming all around me, I could hear Sergeant Olga's voice. On the first floor, I could hear my men engaged in a furious firefight against the rebels. Sir, we got hostiles approaching from all sides. Traitor infantry backed by Bradleys. An explosion outside rocked the building. I peered down over the broken window and saw one traitor Bradley armored infantry fighting vehicle belching smoke from its side in the quad below. The left track and road wheels had been severely damaged by the men's anti-tank fire, but the weapon was still active and firing into our building. Three more Bradleys and about 40 traitor infantry soldiers were steadily approaching. How much anti-tank do we have? I yelled into the radio. Oh, we got three laws and one AT4 left, answered Orgood into his Motorola. What about the Carl Gustav? I said. Oh, that was our last round, answered Orgood. Don't let them in, I yelled. I'll see if I can get some fire support. I just need a minute. Oh, we'll hold for a while, sir said Olgood as the building continued to shudder from the impacts of thousands of enemy rounds. Yeah, but uh, hurry. I rolled over, ripping Private Omar's rucksack open, remembering that he still had two rounds for the Carl Gustav in his pack. Finding them, I scooped up the two rounds and ducked and ran out of the room towards the adjoining room where Specialist Tifa and Private Anne were firing down at the enemy, intending to have one of them take the two anti-tank rounds down to where Sergeant Orgood was fighting with the rest of the platoon. However, as I turned the corner, the wall behind which they were firing from erupted. 25mm auto-cannon fire from one of their M2 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles ripped Anne and Tifa into bloody ribbons, leaving little more than viscous and red spray on the wall and floors. A large gaping hole was punched into the hardened concrete wall, which I looked through and could see the enemy armoured vehicle steadily moving closer before coming to a stop about 200 metres away. All of the other vehicles had stopped, and the traitor soldiers also quit advancing and took cover. I scrambled back into the room which held the parchment, trying to think of a way I could extract it and my men. Before I could get to the radio, I heard a voice speaking over loudspeakers, which had been set up outside. Attention! Soldiers of the 3rd Platoon, Delta Company, 1st Deep Strike Battalion of the Reich's 1st Special Operations Regiment. I am Major General Donald Lincoln. 
I gasped, and ducking low, I peered over the edge of the broken window. There, standing between two enemy Bradleys, was a tall, thin man dressed in an army combat uniform. He looked tired and haggard, almost sad, but stood confidently and exposed over open ground. On either side of him I could see over a hundred enemy traitors in covered fighting positions. More than a few of them looked over at their commanding general as if he were crazy. Son, please, General Lincoln continued, his voice calm, but tinged with sadness. He held his hands out, as if offering some kind of sacrifice. Please, my sons, it doesn't have to be like this. You've been lied to and brainwashed for over twenty years. Your history, your memories, have all been perverted. Oh, that son of a bitch, I said into the Motorola to Sergeant Allgood. That's exactly what our instructors at West Point told us the rebels would say. This only proves that the government was right about those filthy, murdering animals. Sons, continued General Lincoln, what you have in your possession is the last vestige of who you really are and where your values truly come from. I am asking nothing of you. I'm only requesting that you read the parchment which is in your possession. Please, let the senior member of your unit read the parchment. That is all I ask. Then you can go and take the parchment back with you to the capital where it belongs. We'll even give you supplies and fuel if you need. Just, please, read the parchment. I sat in silence, just staring at the enemy commander, hatred filling my heart with each passing heartbeat. Oh, such propaganda. Such smooth, talking propaganda. No, I would not read their filthy parchment, nor would I allow myself or my men to be brainwashed by the filth which was written in it. Sir, said Allgood over the radio, what do we do? We carry out our mission, Sergeant, I answered. I can still attempt to get supporting arms fire if I can contact Captain Jenkins. On my mark, I want all of you to... If, my sons... In the back of your mind, things don't seem right, continued General Lincoln, as if all of a sudden everything went completely upside down and what was once considered good and decent and pure is now evil, and what was once considered evil and cruel is now considered good, then perhaps it's time to take a good long look around you and see what's going on. And if you can see the destruction that has been wrought on this country, I pray that you have the courage to walk away. Walk away. Walk away, I yelled into the motor room. In order for the rightful government of the United States to be established, we must first bring the minority groups, the Untermenschen, into our fold. Once we've enslaved their minds, bodies, and votes, we were done with them. Their revolution only brought about their subjugation to us. And <laughs> now this fool expects us just to walk away. I left my M4 at the general's head. This would be the signal for my men to open fire. In the confusion and the loss of their commanding officer, I should have enough time to call in supporting fires. As I centered my scope on my target, I remembered how, in the past, another vile and despicable man named Lincoln, who had stood against everything we're fighting for today, had been assassinated by one of our party's greatest heroes. A split second before I could fire, one of my soldiers burst from the downstairs floor, waving a makeshift white flag in his hands and walking towards the enemy general. I do not have your parchment, my soldier said, but I have wounded. Please let us deliver them into your care and I will go with you, sir. Well, I took aim and fired. Sergeant Augur's head exploded and his traitorous body fell in a heap a few feet in front of General Lincoln. Almost immediately... The remainder of my men opened fire at the rebel traitors as General Lincoln scrambled to get behind one of the M2 Bradleys. The return fire was worse than before, as I keyed up the mic on my radio to call Captain Jenkins. To my surprise, his voice came up on the other end. Five, he exclaimed. Is that you? I pulled my radio closer to my mouth. I'm in possession of the parchment, but escape and extraction will not be possible. There were more rebels than we thought, and our position will be overrun soon. Do we still have Apaches on standby? We need immediate air support. 
Negative five, said Captain Jenkins. Our Apaches were seized by the first cavalry when they turned rebel. Lieutenant Wilson is dead and I only escaped with three of his men. We hold up about 200 meters south of the terrorist base, just inside the tree line. The sound of incoming rebel fire increased as the building shook violently from an explosion. The rebels were in the building. The shouts of my men echoed up the stairs as their return fire against the rebels faded. What are my orders? I asked. Five, I want a secure channel to Washington, D.C. There's someone there who needs to urgently speak with you, said Captain Jenkins. Wait one. There was a brief pause as Captain Jenkins said to someone on the connecting line to Washington. Sir, he's on the line. Lieutenant Marks, are you there? A new voice boomed from my radio. My ears were ringing from the noise of gunfire and explosions, but I could recognize that voice from his many inspiring and uplifting speeches. His words had captivated a nation, uniting the right-thinking people in our war against those who refused to think properly or to conform. Mr. Prime Minister, I said. Lieutenant Marks, the Prime Minister said calmly, your nation will be eternally grateful for the courage and sacrifices of you and your men. Can you get out with the parchment? Sir, I said. They offered to let us go and allow us to bring the parchment back to Washington, but only on the condition that I read it to them. No, said the Prime Minister. Then, in a more subdued tone, he said, No, Lieutenant. Under no circumstances will you read that filthy parchment. And there's no way you can escape. No, Prime Minister, I said regretfully. I am in possession of their accursed parchment, but we are being overrun, sir. I'm afraid that I cannot exfiltrate from my position. Hmm, I understand, said the Prime Minister solemnly. Lieutenant Marks, son, I need you to understand the extreme importance of your mission. If you cannot get out of there with the parchment, you must destroy it at all costs. Destroy it and every other terrorist artifact which you see there. It's important to the nation that utterly no evidence of the rebel history survives. It shall be done, sir, I said resolutely. To end this war, I'll do what needs to be done, my Fuhrer. Thank you, son, the Prime Minister said. Your name will live on in the Reich for a thousand years. Oh, I felt immensely proud. I looked at the rebel flag hanging on the wall beside the heavy oak table and Pulling out my Zippo lighter, set the flag ablaze. I watched as the broad red and white stripes of the flag, with the blue field of fifty white stars in the upper corner, a symbol of hatred and evil for nearly three hundred years, became engulfed in flames. I then grabbed the ceramic statue which stood over the parchment, a bleeding man nailed to a cross, another symbol of the rebellion's barbaric hatred and evil and intolerance, and I smashed it to bits on the ground. I stepped on the vestige of the man's head, who wore a crown of thorns, over and over again until this symbol of hatred was nothing but powder. Finally, with shaking hands, I picked up the parchment on which the most vile and evil words were ever written by man. What was it which was written on this ancient scroll that turned men into raving animals? What was it about this parchment that made people turn against the government? I had to know. I slowly unrolled the dry and decaying scroll. It was slightly burned on the sides, and I could see flecks of dry blood on it. Apparently this murderous scroll was so sacred to the rebels that some had died to protect and preserve the filth written on it. Well, what I read sent shivers up my spine. Nothing so vile and so abhorrent to man should ever have been put to paper, much less read. What was written here was a direct threat to everything our nation and our dear leader had fought so hard to create, ever since the election of the nation's 44th Prime Minister. He was a man whose powerful name meant he who descended like thunder from the heavens, and all right-thinking Americans worshipped 44 as if he were God. I rolled up the vile scroll and touched the edge to the burning rebel flag and smiled as the scroll, which began with the words... We, the people of the United States, was reduced to ashes. 
There was no more return fire from my men. They were all dead. But we had won. The heart and soul of the rebellion, their history, their bitter clinging to their god and their constitution, had been erased from history. As the first of the rebel soldiers burst into the room, I raised my rifle to my chin and fired. General Lincoln was the first to enter the room and saw the last of the fascist government soldiers blow his own brains out. He was swiftly followed by a dozen other soldiers, each wearing a patch of the American flag on the right sleeve of their combat uniforms. An American soldier quickly came up beside General Lincoln. Sir, he said, we've secured the building. None of the fascists allowed themselves to be taken prisoner. General Lincoln looked down at the dead fascist lieutenant. Ah, they rarely do, Captain, he said in a tired, gravelly voice. I want a status report ASAP. I need to know the number of casualties we took, especially amongst our civilians. We need to start evacuating the compound and get our stinger teams on the roofs, just in case the fascists have any air support. He looked around the room, seeing the burned remains of the flag of the United States the crushed crucifix which had been rescued from St. John's Church in what was once the nation's capital, and the precious parchment reduced a little more than ash. General Lincoln looked down at the second body lying next to the fascist lieutenant, and quickly knelt beside it. He grabbed the fallen soldier's hand and said solemnly, Prepare a burial detail for this man. Lieutenant Colonel Omar was the best counterintelligence officer in the brigade. You'd have never known that the fascists were coming if not for him. They did all this just to destroy the original constitution of the United States of America, said an American Marine who was carrying a Stinger missile launcher. Fascists do this to erase history so they can rewrite it, Sergeant, said General Lincoln. Destroy the past and you can reinvent the history to suit your narrative. That's why they desperately wanted the constitution either returned or destroyed. And that's why we made more copies. General Lincoln looked out of the broken window and down to the compound below at a concrete building relatively untouched by the fighting, but which held America's most precious secret weapon. One of the very few copying machines left in the United States which had not been confiscated by the fascist government. General Lincoln nodded slightly as American soldiers and civilians exited the building loading armfuls of scrolls into an awaiting convoy of trucks and armored vehicles for distribution across the state of Texas and across the border into Mexico, where Americans were preparing to retake their nation. Okay, what on earth did I just read? Can someone tell me? Because I haven't got a clue what... Oh my god! Did you see that coming? Did you? Did you? No, you didn't. Stop telling me you knew what was happening there because you didn't. What a story. Well, obviously that is dedicated to all of my lovely American listeners out there. USA. USA. Did you like that one? Maybe you didn't. I did. Oh, well, good old US of A. You'll win through in the end, no matter what happens. Wow, what a story. Okay, well, oh, oh, I need to take a bit of a breath after that one. That was quite an epic one as far as I'm concerned. Your thoughts, feelings, and comments in the comments section below the video, as ever. Got a feeling there might be quite a few of them this time. Well, my dear friends, a bit tired after that, so I'll take a break, but I'll be back again very, very soon. Till next time, very, very sweet dreams. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.